Welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are from. Um, today's presentation is about to start. Uh, we have David Haney, a system analyst from Florida and also a Linux moderator, uh, presenting the Internet MVC, what it is and why you should care. Before I hand over to David, I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping and just uh, uh, do a few announcements. First off, a uh, very big thank you to our sponsors, our primary sponsors, which is Oxweb and Telerik, for their continued support of the Lidnock community. Also, upcoming events in May. We have uh, three events in May. We have Scott Guthrie Unplugged Session 9. Uh, the open uh, Q&A session that we have every three months with Scott, and that's on the 10th of May. Uh, Saint Nebulsi is doing a Visual Studio Tips and Tricks Greatest Hits. He's doing a morning session at 10.30 and an evening session at 7.30 on the 31st of May. In June, we have open data for open web with uh, Lohit and Nagarad on the 9th of June, and curing your testing blues of Visual Studio and TFS 2010 uh, with Angela Dugan. Uh, very much looking forward to these. Uh, we have a couple of uh, events uh, scheduled for July as well, but we haven't quite gotten all the details not around yet. As usual, you can get to us on linkedin.com slash groups, uh, and GID is uh, 43315, or simply search for LinkedIn.net users group on LinkedIn. Our unofficial website is lidlook.org. We have uh, a couple of different notification formats as well. We have our calendars, uh, HTML, XML, and a web calendar. All the links are there. Also, linuxevents.eventbrite.com is also where you can see all of our events upcoming. We Twitter, uh, of course, at twitter.com slash lidnock, facebook.com lidnock, and if you need to get a hold of us or you have a question or comment, email us at info at lidnock.org. Uh, also, I want to say thank you from the Lidnock team for everybody to, to turn up today, and for, to David for uh, putting his hand up and actually presenting on ASP.NET MVC. Uh, David, uh, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, and welcome to Lidnock. Thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully, you can hear me no problem. Uh, as mentioned, my name is David Haney. I'm a systems analyst currently working in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, right now, I'm working with a company that's implementing ASP.NET MVC on a large scale for a, uh, a very rapid e-commerce system, uh, high volume, high amount of users, very complex system. Um, and at the same time, I noticed there was a demand for, for MVC presentations, so I figured I would, I would give that a shot. Uh, two things I want to mention, first of all. Number one is that I'm not that familiar with live meetings, so if I start to screw it up, just bear with me, but hopefully I won't. And uh, number two, if you have any questions, Feel free to ask them during the presentation. Um, I will also do a Q&A session at the very end of the presentation, but if you have anything relevant to what we're doing at the time and it's you know something I can kind of knock out as I'm going, I'll definitely answer it uh, on the fly. So having said that, I'm going to try to switch over to my presentation here. Um, so this will be an introduction to ASP.NET MVC. Uh, there will be a coding component as well as a uh, presentation component. We'll kind of switch back and forth on that. Uh, there will be uh, things that aren't done, you know, some of you might recognize things as not being done optimally in this uh, demonstration, and that's been, that's intentional, and that's so that I can teach you. It's, it's more of the purpose is to teach you versus to do it, you know, necessarily the so-called best or right way. Uh, so without further ado, uh, my contact information is down here on the bottom right. It will again be presented at the end of the, uh, of the slide deck, and you can download the slide deck, uh, however that's done through live meeting. Uh, so, the goal of this presentation is to teach you some things about MVC, and uh, what you will learn first and foremost is what it is, uh, when to use it, as in when it's a, a good option or when it's you know not necessarily the best option for for your application. 
um, the advantages of MVC, which also sort of inherently covers the disadvantages of MVC. Um, we'll explain the pipeline, basically the process of what happens when a request comes into your application. Uh, we'll go through the basic components of it, which include uh, routes, models, controllers, views, um, an optional component called areas, which we'll touch on briefly. And then we'll start to head in toward uh, the more advanced features, things such as action filter attributes, master pages, uh, the view data and view bank objects, and you know contrasting those against strongly typed views. All of this will make sense by the end, I promise. Um, HTML helpers, partial views, uh, binding form inputs to models, data annotations, and server-side validation. And at the very end, we'll sort of briefly touch on how to customize uh, the framework if you start to use it and kind of say to yourself, well, I wish it would do this instead, or I wish it would handle this in a particular way. Well, you can actually, in most cases, implement that yourself. Um, so what you'll hopefully walk away with is the foundation in ASP.NET MVC and the core components. Uh, the differences between MVC and traditional ASP.NET web development, which uh, most of you are probably very familiar with at this point, I would guess. Um, you'll hopefully have an understanding of when to use MVC and when not to use MVC, as we discussed. I'm going to show you some neat tips and tricks, and I mean, don't feel like you have to take notes. Uh, I'm not going to discourage you from doing so, but you can download the entire presentation, as we mentioned. Uh, resources to rely on when you have questions, and uh, by the end of this, you should be able to build your own applications in MVC with, with a fair amount of confidence. Uh, what is ASP.NET MVC? Um, it is a Microsoft built platform for creating web applications which focus highly on the model view controller design pattern. Uh, so model view controller has been around a while. You might have heard it discussed in you know agile environments relating to design patterns and so forth. And long story short, this is the Microsoft sort of implementation of that as, a, as an architectural platform for web design and development. Um, a quote that I stole from the website. ASP.NET MVC gives you a powerful patterns-based way to build dynamic websites that enable a clean separation of concerns and that gives you full control over markup for enjoyable agile development. Uh, a lot of buzzwords in that, but it is basically what I described before. Um, it's a completely different paradigm and dynamic than traditional ASP.NET web application development, so there's a lot of things to adjust to, uh, and we'll go into details of that, but you know, first and foremost, you don't have code behinds, you don't really wire up into page events, you don't have grid views or any other user controls that use postbacks or view state. You don't have view state, and so on. Um, the goal of the MVC platform is to, it aims to simplify web application development and maintenance by separating concerns, separating business logic from the web page, for example, and, and so forth. Um, and it's ideally going to enable a rapid enterprise level web application development for your organization. Um, when to use ASP.NET MVC, uh, the advantages uh, include the fact that it makes it easier to manage complexity by dividing an application into the model of view and the controller layers. Um, it doesn't use view state or server-based forms. Uh, so this makes the framework ideal for developers who want total control. I mean, a lot of us are probably familiar with the whole syntax of CTL00 underscore that gets slapped on your IDs when you create divs and whatnot, and that can be very frustrating to front-end developers who use a lot of JavaScript. So this, this sort of doesn't do that. Um, this is sort of a what you see is what you get view. Um, it uses a front controller pattern that processes web application requests through a single controller. Uh, this basically enables you to design an application that supports a rich routing infrastructure. Uh, there's a link there that you can follow after the presentation. Uh, long story short, it, it, it's a different paradigm as we discussed, and it's something that simplifies uh, sites that would otherwise be complex in the traditional uh, web form application. Um, it does provide better support for test-driven development, significantly better than, than postbacks. Um, and it works well for web applications that are supported by large teams of developers and for web designers who need a high degree of control over their application behavior. Um, conversely, it's, it's not necessarily the best for small teams of developers because it's kind of overkill. It would be like taking a bazooka to a, to a molehill. Um, and we'll discuss that down below here in the uh, advantages of the web form space application, which is your typical application that you're probably developing now. Uh, the typical web forms-based application supports an event model that preserves state over HTTP, uh, which benefits line of business web application development. Uh, the web forms-based application provides dozens of events that are supported in hundreds of server controls. Um, those are the ASCX controls that you're familiar with and know and love or hate, depending on your viewpoint. Um, it uses a page controller pattern that adds functionality to individual pages. And again, there's a link you can follow after the presentation for more info on that. Um, it uses a view state on server-based forms, which can make managing state information easier. Uh, some of you might be familiar with view state. 
It works well for small teams of web developers and designers who want to take advantage of the large number of components available for rapid application development. And in general, it's less complex for application development because the components are tightly integrated and usually require less code. So long story short, you should use MVC when you have a fairly large application that may be maintained by multiple people and is somewhat complex. And you should not use MVC for a fairly small application, such as your personal website, uh, because it's, it's way too much effort for something so small and so easily done manually or through traditional web application development. Um, now, I'm going to note just here that not all of my slides are stolen from Microsoft, but the first couple of descriptions seem to make sense. I didn't want to rewrite the book. So um, this one I'm not really going to go over in huge detail, but essentially you can read it afterwards. Um, as we mentioned, the advantages include separation of application tasks, and that's done through the, uh, the layers, the model, the view, and the controller, as well as routing. Uh, it's an extensible and pl pluggable framework, which means you can basically customize it. Um, it supports routing, which is built into the installer that installs MVC for you. Um, the support for using the markup in existing ASP.NET pages and user controls and master pages uh, still exists, so you can kind of convert applications to MVC somewhat easily. Um, and it supports you know, all the things you're used to, master pages, nested master pages, inline expressions, uh, declarative server controls, that is those that don't rely on post, back, and view state, and so forth. Uh, templates, data binding, localization, etc. And uh, it supports existing ASP.NET features, so you can use forms authentication and Windows authentication and all that good stuff that, that you might be familiar with now. Um, the MC pipeline, I think this is the last slide I stole off Microsoft's uh, MSDN and whatnot, but effectively what happens when you use an ASP.NET application from the user's perspective and also from the developer's perspective, um, the application receives the first request HTTP request, uh, and in the global ASAX file, the route objects are added to the route table object. Um, then routing is performed, which basically means that the URL routing module will find the appropriate route for what you what URL you've gone to, and map that to uh, a request context and uh, route data object. Uh, effectively, after that, it'll create a request handler, which you don't need to worry too much about, honestly. Uh, that will create the appropriate controller. Um, and then it'll execute the action on that controller. And the act we'll talk about all this in forthcoming slides, so don't worry. Um, it'll invoke that action, and then it'll execute the result. And the result is typically a view result. So, you know, you, uh, a view result you can think of as a, as a web page. Uh, okay, on to the more appropriate stuff that's, that I'm actually writing instead of just copying. Uh, first, we'll talk about routes. So ASP.NET routing is a technology that exists outside of MVC, but is used and included within the framework. Uh, there's a link there to routing if, if you're not familiar with it, but effectively it's a paradigm shift from um, having hard-coded HTML pages like default.aspx and stuff like that. It, it's, it's a paradigm shift to um, using URLs to route to files, but not directly. Uh, and they're defined, routes are defined URL patterns that are mapped to controllers and actions, uh, and action methods, pardon me, within controllers. And this enables SEO and user-friendly URLs. Um, you've probably seen these in blog posts and whatnot. So instead of like yoursite.com slash about slash contact us study SPX, you might have yoursite.com slash about slash contact dash us or, you know, slash about dash contact dash us or anything else you want, really, um, all of which you could route to, you know, behind the scenes that contact us ASPX file, but you're not going to access it directly. Um, and then, as I mentioned just now, you don't usually map directly to a view file. Um, it can be used for intuitive state or action representation, such as in RESTful Web Services. So the RESTful Web Services use the HTTP verbs, get, post, put, delete. Uh, you could actually include those keywords in your URL. You could have your site slash put user or something if you want to sort of represent that intuitively. Um, MVC routing supports pattern matching and wildcards, which makes it fairly powerful. Uh, so you don't have to sort of create a unique route for every single permutation of what you're trying to do. You can have sort of like parameters and, and, as we said, wildcards that will handle things for you in a sort of generic way that you can customize. Um, you can pass portions of the URL to your action method as a parameter to the method, which is very powerful, and we'll show you as we go. Uh, and routes are defined in the global.asax file, and routing assemblies are included uh, via web.config. All that is done automatically when you, when you open a new um, MVC project, uh, which I'm actually going to do in a second here. Uh, a sub note is that the, the four sections here are the sections that are used in WebConfig to define the routing, and be careful not to delete them. 
because if you do, you won't have any routing, which means your site will basically 404 on every possible page ever. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start by building our application. Uh, by all means, show it or ask me a question or something if you don't see it come up here, but hopefully it will. Uh, so this is your typical Visual Studio 2010 installation. Uh, one thing I've done behind the scenes that you obviously won't be seeing is I've configured um, an, a website in IIS for this presentation, for this application I'm going to build, and I'm going to point it to where we, we start the project. And I've also configured that to run in .NET 4.0 because I'm, in this case, programming a .NET 4.0. Uh, note that you can program in, in 3.5 with uh, MVC as well. You don't have to use 4.0. So once you've done the, the install for MVC, you actually have a type of project you can, uh, you can launch, just your standard ASP.NET MVC2 web application. I'm going to call it uh, Presentation App, and I'm going to put it on a C, create a directory for the solution. I'm not going to do unit tests because that's not really relevant to our presentation, but in general, I would say it's a decent idea. Um, I'm just going to go behind the scenes here for a second and configure the site to point to that path. C drive. There it is, presentation app. For some reason I couldn't see it. Quick restart. And you'll need to do this, obviously, when you create your own uh, application. You'll need to configure IIS to be able to access it and test it locally and so forth. So I just finished doing that. Um, one thing you'll notice is that when you create an MVC project, it actually builds like a default test project for you. It gives you a sample model, some controllers, some content, some scripts, and uh, some views. Now, um, I, I thought about it, and I decided that showing you this stuff as it exists doesn't really teach you much because it's kind of, you know, you can find the stuff on the Internet. You can Google this. You can use Stack Overflow, whatever. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to blow away uh, most of the files that I created and uh, uh, create it from scratch. Let's see. I'm just going to load it up in the background here. That's interesting. Right off the bat, of course, I get an exception. Um, I'm going to share this with you in a second here. So you should be able to see this lovely area I just got now. Um, I'm not load your presentation app MVC application, which is, oh, obviously I haven't compiled it. How silly. Opening night jitters, everybody. So one thing you want to do uh, once you create your application, but before you test it, is compile it. See if I can get this back. So we'll do a build. The build succeeded. And then if we go back here, sorry, I just have to keep switching between content. There we go. If we reload this, we should have a useful application now. There we go. So uh, this is the application that gets installed with MVC. Um, it is a web page, it's functional, it does demo some features, but I'm going to blow it away and start from scratch. So all I'm going to do to accomplish that is go back to our classes here. I'm going to delete uh, the controllers that I created. I'm going to delete the model I created. I'm going to leave the scripts. Um, I'm going to delete the views I created. Get rid of all this stuff. So basically, it looks pretty simple now. Uh, so going back to our presentation, we were just discussing routes. Uh, routes exist in the global.asax file. Uh, effectively, it creates a default route for you, which uh, maps to wildcards for controller, action, and ID. Uh, this takes parameters. Uh, so it takes the name of the route, the URL for the route, and then the default objects. You can do that as an anonymous um, object that's, as you see, your anonymous class. Whoops, I just drag and drop that. So in this case, um, if this doesn't map, then the default is home, index, and the ID is an optional parameter. And this is one way to specify an optional parameter uh, in a strongly typed way. 
Uh, so I'm going to leave this as is for now because we're going to come back and create some, some custom routes uh, later on. But this is what it looks like effectively. And then you'll see that the application start just registers all the areas, which again I'll explain, and then registers the routes, which is the method that does, does the routing. Let's see here. Hopefully this will take us back to the presentation. So that's Ruts on the whole. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense as we go. Uh, models uh, represent the bridge between the view layer and the controller layer. So the two purposes they serve are to relay data from the controller to the view, and also to structure and validate form post data from the view back to the controller. So the typical MVC pattern and application works in that your controller uh, does your business logic and creates a model. And a model is, is just a, a POCO or a plain old you know, C-sharp object or whatever acronym you want to use. It's just a basic class with properties often that you populate. And then the controller will populate that model and pass it to the view. Um, similarly, in, in the MVC implementation by Microsoft, the view can post data back to the controller, and you can use a model to sort of capture that data. Uh, so the model is the bridge between the two. Um, models also allow you to validate your, your, your form post data automatically, which is very powerful, and we'll get into that as we go. Uh, as I said, they're, they're plain and simple classes. They're populated by controllers or form posts, depending which way you're going. If you're using a get request, typically the, the controller populates it. If you're doing a post, the form will often, uh, pardon me, the form post will often populate it. Um, they're accessed, you can access them in both views and controllers. Um, and an example would be like a class user login model with public string properties, username and password. And actually I'm going to build that right now because I'm going to build an application that, that has a login. So if we go back to the, sorry again I don't know that meeting that well. Uh, presentation app. There we go. We're going to create a model. Um, and to do that, it's just new class. We're going to call it the login model with typos, apparently. Uh, and this is, you know, as simple as it gets, really. We're going to do a public string username, get set, public string password, get set. That's a model. We just, we just build one from scratch. There you go. So, pretty simple so far, right? That's done. Uh, heading back to the presentation here. Uh, so we just created a login model, and we have a username and password, which we'll be using down the road here. Uh, controllers uh, perform key functions to the application. They receive incoming requests if the request is routed to them. Uh, they handle user input from form posts. Uh, they execute appropriate business logic. At least they should. If you're doing a business logic in your view, you've got bigger problems. Uh, and they handle exceptions. Uh, this is sort of optional, because you can also... Uh, you can strap in a, an HTTP module to handle exceptions if anybody's ever kind of made an error module. You can do the same kind of thing here, so you don't have to have your controller handle the exception. Um, controllers consist of action methods, uh, which can take parameters and return an action result. So parameters are automatically mapped by conventional name, so there's no need to dig into the request, the request for them, uh, the request object. This is probably the best part of MVC right here, um, and I'm going to show you what this means in a second. Uh, action methods often have a one-to-one -one mapping with user actions. So what that means is you don't want to create a single controller with a single action that does everything, because that's basically procedural programming. Uh, you want to create, you know, maybe a login controller if you have, or maybe a user controller or account controller if you have user account or login specific actions. So then you could have login, change password, send and forgot password email, that kind of stuff in the controller. You really want to break up your stuff into, into meaningful controllers and actions. You don't want to really build very complex actions. And again, single responsibility principle. If your action isn't doing what it sort of imp should implicitly do by the name of it, maybe it's called log in. If it does more than log you in, then maybe that should be a different action. Um, the goal is to keep the controller action method as simple as possible. So the general controller lifecycle is that the controller receives either a get request or form, form post data, pardon me. Uh, it performs business logic, so it invokes methods, instantiates classes, persists things to the database, grabs things from the database or the cache or whatever you do in your application. It populates that information to a model, uh, which again is like the login model we just built, and then it returns a view result with the model passed as a parameter. So your best practice is to create a helper, um, pardon me, let me start that again. So one best practice that you'll want to employ 
with controllers, um, and this will save you a lot of grief down the road, is to create a helper or handler class that does your business logic. Um, and the reason for that is that so you can call those methods within your controller and return the values to populate the model or make decisions. Um, and that way your business logic isn't locked into your controller action. And since I said you want to have a lot of actions, you don't want to have to copy and paste similar methods or business logic things. So you'll want to have uh, separate classes that do that logic, and you can call those classes from your, from your controller. Um, and as I just said, this allows your controller to share similar functionality easily, such as sending an email or authenticating a user without copying and pasting your code throughout action methods, which is something that your coworkers will probably hate you for doing. Um, I know mine do. But um, you can use the dependency injection framework to inject these classes to your controller. It's really great for unit testing and rapid development. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of dependency injection. Uh, if you do some research on it and understand what it is, uh, it's very easy to implement in MVC. Uh, generally, controllers must be located. Uh, well, let me let me start this part again. Uh, most things that are done in the MVC framework are done by convention of naming. So the controllers in this case must be located in the controllers folder. Uh, typically, uh, they should be named whatever controller, and they should inherit from the controller class, which itself inherits from the controller base class. So now we're going to build a controller. Once I get back to my Visual Studio, I think that did it. So under controllers, because we installed MVC, we actually have the option to add controller, which is probably what you're going to want to do. It makes it pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to call this the home controller because I'm going to build a sort of a welcome page. You can alt, you know, you can optionally add action methods for create, update, update delete, and, and details. I don't really feel like that's useful. Um, I would recommend not doing that typically. It's still going to create you a default. This is what a controller looks like. It's a home controller, which implements controller, which if you look through the metadata, implements controller base and a bunch of other good stuff. Uh, it already has a get of home for you built in. Uh, the index is sort of like the default in most cases as defined by the route. So we're going to use this exactly like it is because uh, we don't need our, our welcome page to do anything dynamic. It's not going to store anything yet. It's just going to be a hello page. So this is actually done. We didn't have to code anything. We'll go back to, uh, uh, I should say we haven't had to code anything yet. We're going to customize this, but for now it works. Um, back to the presentation, and I'll introduce views, and we'll, we'll get the application really rolling. Um, one thing that's continued from controllers is the different types of action results that you can return. Uh, I'm going to switch back really quickly to the app, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about with these methods. You'll notice that the method is public. It returns an action result. It's called index in this case. It takes no parameters right now. It returns a view, which is a view result. So this is uh, a view result is one of many types of results that you can return from an action result method in your controller. If we go back, it's just loading over. So these are the different kinds of things you can actually return and what they do. So there's a view result. There's a helper method called view. You'll notice that our code called view instead of return new view result. It just said return view. Um, it renders the view as a web page. So that's what you're going to do all the time, pretty much 99% of the time. Uh, partial view result is a partial view helper method, and this renders a partial view, which defines a section of view that can be rendered inside another view. This is basically a user control, or what you know as a user control, an ASCX file that you can implement and embed into multiple views. Um, redirect result. The helper method is redirect, redirects to another action method by using its URL. There's also the redirect to route result, which has uh, these two helper methods, and they redirect to another action method not by using its URL. Uh, don't worry about the difference between those right now. Just think redirect when you want to do redirect. Uh, content result, uh, the helper method is content, and it can return a user-defined content type. So maybe you have a control action method that returns an image or something, or a PDF, who knows? I mean, the sky's the limit. JSON result uh, returns JSON data, serialized JSON object, in fact. Uh, another really nice feature of MVC is that it does automatic JSON serialization and deserialization for you, which alleviates a whole lot of pain when you're developing web apps that use AJAX and so forth. Uh, JavaScript result can return a uh, script to be executed on the client. I've never used this. Uh, I'm not really sure what it does or how powerful it would be. I'm guessing that it probably embeds JavaScript inline on your page. Um, 
By the way, I, I haven't used it. I haven't seen a need for it. Uh, file result, again, you can do binary output. Um, and then empty result is a way to sort of like return null without returning null, actually. Um, and the value that has is that in a partial view, you might want to render it only under certain conditions. Like you might have a view that advertises things to your customers, but you may only want to render it when you're not on the account or profile edit page. So you could have a clause in your partial view that says, you know, or in your controller that renders your view, if you have, if you're on the account page, uh, render empty result. And that would just not render anything back. Uh, let's see here. Views are sort of the third key component. Views are web pages or ASPX files which use the standard web form view engine. You can change that, but for this presentation, we're not going to. Uh, and they have some key differences. So there's no code behinds, there's no server side forms, there's no user controls that use a few state or postbacks. So this right here is going to raise a whole lot of bells with, with some of you folks that have been developing traditional ASP.NET applications because you're probably familiar with all those things and rely on them heavily to do your application uh, logic and to, and to make things work. And this is why, as I said before, it's quite a paradigm shift. Um, the learning curve could be steep depending on the person, but I, you really will see the benefits of it if you get started in it and, and give it a try. Um, views can be strongly typed which means they can be bound to a model object, which is ridiculously awesome. Uh, you don't have to late bind things and kind of cast things in your view and hope they work. And we're going to show you this right away. It's very powerful. Uh, you can also get data from two helper sort of dictionaries that are called view data or view bag. We're going to discuss that further on. Generally, if you want to return a view from a controller's action method, Sorry, somebody's talking there. If you want to return a view from a controller's action method, you need to create a subfolder in the views folder with the same name as your controller. In that subfolder, you must create an ASPX file with the same name as the controller's action method. So this, again, goes back to that by naming convention thing we were talking about. So if you have account controller.login, which returns a view, then you would place that view in slash views slash account, which is the controller name, slash login, which is the method name. So it's all convention. So I'm going to go ahead and build the view for our main page, which is going to be really simple and might not even have a model. So in views, you have two folders. You have your base folder, and you have your shared folder. Your shared is where you're going to put your master pages and stuff like that. And you can even put your uh, partial components there, your user controls, your ACX files. You'll also notice you have a web.config file here. This file serves the purpose of blocking direct access to pages. And you don't really want to change that because that circumvents the whole point of MVC. So this is going to say anything that you try to directly access is going to give you a not found. Um, and that's done intentionally so that you rely on routing instead of going to, you know, pay like mysite.com slash views slash whatever. Uh, so we're going to create a view. And right away you'll see that you have this built in because you did the install and it's fairly useful. Uh, now on our home controller, the view, the action method is called index. Uh, so we're going to create a view called index. And actually, I screwed up already because I need to create a folder called home. So we're going to create the home folder, and then we're going to spell it properly. And then we're going to add the view in the home folder called index. Uh, we have the option here to create a partial view or a strongly typed view. We're going to do neither of those right now, so it's just going to be pretty boring. Um, you can select a master page here. I guess we can run through master pages. I mean, it takes 10 seconds, and it's you know something you're going to do a lot of the time. So we're going to add a new item to shared. Uh, we're going to add an MVC2 view master page. This is important. This is not the same as a master page. They have differences. I'm going to discuss them in this presentation. Make sure you use the MVC master page. We're just going to call it default of master. Um, we're going to have it, you know, that's pretty good. I mean, this is going to be a pretty ugly website because I'm not in it to design it. I'm in it to make it work. And um, we have a main content thing here that runs the server. Now you'll notice, not much else runs the server. You can set a title content if you want. For whatever reason, the head runs the server. That's optional, believe it or not. Uh, and not much else runs the server. So having built this master page, we can now build our view using the master page. We're going to call it index because that was the controller's action method. We're not going to create a strong type view, but we are going to build a master page, default.master. The main content area that we want to use is called main content. We press add. Suddenly, it's all done. And we're going to just write a little welcome to the site deal here. I saved it. 
that's your view. Uh, you're going to notice that it inherits from view page dynamic. This is sort of the default, meaning that you um, you aren't on a strongly typed view. There's no model that you're passing to it or intending to pass to it. So you don't really have any uh, strongly typed access to data, but we don't need it because it's an index page. So now we've got welcome to the site. Uh, we've called the title index. There's a little H2 header that says index. Looks good to me. So we've now built a master page, an index that uses the master page, a model, and a controller. We haven't used the model yet, though, because we haven't done any login stuff. We have a controller with an actual result of index. So you might intuitively think all of a sudden that we can go to our website, slash home, slash index, and make things work, but you would actually be wrong. I'm just going to compile this. I'm going to switch to the parser error website. I'm going to reload this. And what's probably going to happen is you're going to get a 404. Oh, oh right, because we left the uh, default route in. So I was supposed to delete that. So the default route is helping us out here. What's happening is it's finding the controller and the action and the ID. It's not matching this, so it's returning the default of controller home action index. So if I scrap this, um, so do it the quick way. And now we have no routes. If I rebuild the application and I reload the page, we should get a 404 or forbidden because it's just trying to list a root directory. Um, you see that it's trying to, to list the route, the root and not working. Um, the reason this is happening is because we have no routes. You cannot try and hack it and go to view slash home slash index.aspx. I think that's what we called it. It's not going to find it. It's 404 because of that uh, web config that deletes it. So the only way to get, get access to your website is to route it. So we're going to do that now. So I was supposed to do that first, and then I screwed it up. The first thing you generally want to do is routes.clear, which deletes any existing routes. Um, don't ask me why you're going to do that. It'll come in handy later when you get to the point where you understand why you're doing it. We're going to map a new route. Uh, it's going to be called the, I don't know, home route. We're going to give it the URL of slash, and we're going to give it the default of... I'm not actually too worried about defaults. We're going to give it... Let's see here. I've forgotten how to map things. That's brilliant. Give me two seconds. Logic defaults, string namespaces, logic constraints. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. You do use the object defaults. That's right. So you create a new object, anonymous object. Uh, you set the controller to whatever you want. In this case, we're going to do home. You set the action to index. Uh, the reason I forgot that, by the way, is because the application I've been working on day and night has a custom routing that uses regular expressions and is stored in the database. So I'm not used to the traditional routing. Um, it's not that forgetful. Uh, we're not going to create an ID here because we're not using it. So that's what happens. We have a route that basically maps. Um, it's called a home route. The site of slash basically makes it happen. And it's a new controller's home action is index. If I screw that too badly, when we go to the main page, it should now map there. And again, you still can't access this page. And I actually screwed that up badly. And I'll start with a uh, total. That's right. Again, I've totally forgotten how to route, so bear with me 10 seconds, and I'll clear myself up here. Uh, I think you just do this to make it a wild card. In which case, everything uh, cannot contain these characters. Terrific. Let's see here. Let me get anything. Sorry about this. Again, custom routing. It's painful to go back to the old stuff. Doesn't like anything either. RNA wrote URL. Oh, I understand what it's saying. Uh, it's saying... Sorry about this, guys. It's saying that basically it can't be just a, a random um, wildcard parameter, effectively. I'm just going to recompile that. I feel better already. Okay. So now we find that this routes to the main page. 
after a little bit of hassle and some hiccups there. Sorry about that. Again, I use custom routing, so I haven't used the, uh, the base routing in a long time, and realistically, I probably should have looked it up before I did the presentation. Um, Eric mentions that I think you have to map the route to a URL. He's absolutely right. Um, and I did in that case by routing it to slash in this case. So now we've got the main page. It doesn't do much. It's not very exciting. Uh, one thing I'll show you, if I can show you, I'm going to have to share my source code thing with you real quick. Let's see. I think this should do it. There you go. You'll notice that you don't get a lot of crazy markup. Your div, you know, doesn't have any special IDs. There's no dollar signs and underscores and crazy long names. And that's an incredibly valuable aspect of, uh, of MVC. Having shown you that, we'll move back to, I think it's taking me back to the presentation. I just closed that and it kind of vanished. Let's see. Presentation. There we go. So that's a view in a nutshell. Uh, so we have a view, we have a controller that returns a view, and we routed the controller after many failed attempts. Uh, one thing that I'll mention at this point is areas. So areas are a logical grouping of related models using controllers within an MVC application. Um, it's a way to keep things organized in a very large application. Uh, it's a mini MVC framework within your application effectively. It's optional. You can have as many as you want or none at all. Um, and an example where you might use it is an e-commerce website that has a product, browse, account, checkout, and help desk functionality. Um, you could create four areas for those functions. You could have like the browse area, the account area, excuse me, the checkout area and the help desk area. And that just keeps things a little cleaner and more intuitive. You have a new programmer join your company and you can say, hey, you're going to work on, you know, help desk. It's all under the help desk area. Have fun. And they don't run all over the place trying to find things. Um, and areas, I believe, have their own web config file, which can be used to customize behavior, uh, just like the one that you saw in, in the main application. I'm not going to do an area because uh, I really don't have anything to do it for and it makes things a little more complex. But effectively, I'm going to show you the uh, folder. Can you guys see my Visual Studio right now? I know nobody's going to answer me, but hopefully you can. Just trying something different in a live meeting. Nope, we're not seeing it. Fair enough. I'll uh, manually access it. Thanks, Brian. Now you probably see it. So I wrote it. I created a home route. Uh, it's anything slash controllers home action is index. So. The areas folder that we were talking about uh, is something that you actually create manually. I don't believe it gets created for you. And you just create it right at the base layer. Uh, you can actually go add area, and it creates the entire deal for you. I'm not going to do it because it, it actually ironically makes a mess of things if you have a fairly small application. Uh, having said that, one thing we're going to do on our website, because having just a plain old page doesn't really show you much and isn't very entertaining, is have a logon page. And we're going to basically create a fake situation where you're going to log into the website, and then you're going to get a success page if you were successful. And eventually, we're going to slap some stuff on the success page where it won't render if you're not logged in. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a login controller. Uh, called a logon controller. Again, it defaults, but we're going to create a login action result. And for now, it's just going to return a view. Uh, now, here's the thing you're kind of maybe thinking at this point, what if I want to do different logic when I get and when I post? And that's a very good question. By default, this accepts either. But one nice thing is you can actually specify which action is accepted by this method. So as it is right now, if I post a login, I'll actually get a 404 because it's only going to accept get. But what this allows me to do is actually create a post method of the same name, and it can have different parameters. Whoops. Man, I can't type. Uh, and we're going to give it the logon model. I think that's what I call it. Login model. That's going to make me crazy. So I'm just going to call it the login logon model right now. Make sure I've changed it. Uh, so we're going to go logon model model. It probably doesn't find it right away. We're going to use IntelliSense to include whatever we need to include for that. There you go. And again, we're just going to return view for now. But here's a different thing. We're going to return view of model. So this sort of sets up a framework for you. Um, now, basically, to log on, we're going to need to present you a form. 
And as I mentioned, there are no forms, uh, server-side forms, in ASP.NET MVC. So what you end up doing is creating plain old HTML forms, uh, but not as plain as you think. And I'll show you what I mean. So because we created a logon controller, we're going to create a logon. So I screwed up again. We're going to create a logon folder by convention. And we're going to create a view here called login. Uh, this time, we're going to do a strongly type view. And it's going to be to the login model. And it can use the same default master. You might want to choose a different one in reality. But again, we're teaching you things here. And default master is not one of them. Uh, main content. And we get a view. Now, you'll notice a difference here, a pretty big one. In index.aspx, it's view page dynamic. In login ASPX, it's view page presentation app models login model. What does this do for me? I'll show you. I'm going to create very quickly a form. Method is post. Action is we make it slash login, or we can make it something like slash logon slash login, but let's just call it slash login for now. And again, you could totally do this however you want in your application. Um, doesn't need a name or anything, as far as I remember. So here's our form. Wow. Sorry about that. Um, now we've got a form. It's going to tell us that the file login was not found, because IntelliSense, ironically, is not built for MVC, and it looks for physical files. Um, on that note, if you want to include images and stuff like that, by default, you can throw it in the content folder. Um, and the reason for that, or the scripts folder, or you can create another folder called images if you want. Um, and these things will all serve. So basically, it's going to serve anything that's not a CS file. And you shouldn't have any view files within the root folder. All your view files will be within views, which has a web config which denies access to them. And that's why you have to route to them, if all that makes sense to you. So, you know, typical form stuff would be input type is uh, text, name is, in this case, take note of what I'm calling it, username. Uh, you know, we're not going to give it a value. And we'll maybe put something pretty here like username. And I'm going to do the same thing for password, and I'm going to copy paste because I'm a lazy guy. Uh, input type here is going to become password, I think. And we're going to call this password. So now we have a page with a very simple, very boring form. And you might think to yourself, well, that's great, but I really don't want to have to you know, maintain all this manual HTML all the time. And that sort of doesn't seem very intuitive in this modern age of technology. And you would be absolutely right. Uh, and here's where the really cool stuff comes in handy in ASP.NET MVC. Uh, I'm going to render this. And I'm going to show you what this does first. And then I'm going to show you some really neat tricks. So we're going to build a route for login. Now, it's important to note that routes are matched in the order they are added. So if you add anything below this route that catches everything, you're never going to get to anything else, because this will always be true, this one here. And it will always just go to index, so you add it above it. So note the self, default route, catch all route, very bottom. We're going to call this the login route, or logon route. I use them interchangeably, so forgive me if I call one the other. We're going to make this go to slash logon. And we're going to make it run the logon controller with the action of login. And we're going to save that. I'm going to just comment this as default catch all route. I'm going to call this the logon route. Oh, and also, if you guys like at the end, I can wrap this up and, and add this to the presentation so you can download it, install it, run it, tinker with it, whatever you, whatever you want to do. OK, so now we have two routes, login route and an anything route. This should catch login before this catches the generic stuff. And I'm pretty sure this route is wrong, but forgive me. Again, I haven't done it uh, traditionally in a while. So I'm going to build this. Everything builds successfully. One warning, because IntelliSense thinks that the file login can't be found, which you're going to start to love as you uh, develop MVC. Uh, and then we're going to switch over to the website. I think it's right here. Oh, whoops. I just did something funny. Sorry, I'm a live meeting newbie. I'm going to try that again. I'd like an item to share with other people in the meeting. But I did. Is it this one? Yes, it is this one. Fair enough. So we still have our index page. I totally screwed that route up. Now start with a slash, which makes sense. 
uh, so we're going to call just log on. We're going to call this slash anything slash we'll leave that alone. So all I'm doing is I'm removing the slash from the beginning of our, our route. Sorry, routing is the only part that's going to be shaky in this presentation again because I haven't done it the old way in a while. Uh, all I did here was I got rid of this. So now it's just log on. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to recompile it. I'm going to switch back to our local host. I think this is it right here. Live meeting is glitching out on me. Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to. It should still work. Like I should still be able to make it work. I was doing something funny to me. Okay, you should be on the page with broke. Which one no longer break? Um, except that now it does break, so I screwed up my default route. So I'm going to make login happen. And login returns index because it's the catch all route. So I totally screwed up my routing. So give me six seconds and I'll fix that. Uh, we're going to get rid of this anything catch. And we're going to do index. Um, again, you can do catch all routes. Sorry, guys, I really honestly forget how to do it. It's fairly simple. But I've been in such complex routing stuff that I've totally lost track of this, and I really should have done my research before I started the presentation. So we have a login route. We have an index route. This one goes to index. This one goes to login. The downside of this is we're going to have to start referring to the site very explicitly as slash index and slash login. Um, again, there's a way to circumvent that, but I forget how to do it right now, and I don't want to spend 20 minutes looking it up. So this is our site. If we go to login, uh, it's telling me I can't find it. That's terrific. If we go to index, it should find that. Did I call it log on? Uh, yes, I did. Have message log models not exist in the namespace. Presentation app models. Log in model. I named it to log on model. I probably did. Let's go back and fix that. So model is called the log on model. Log on model. The view it looks like is dynamic here. Yeah, it's typed to the login model. That's my only problem. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind of, too, is when you rename, you need to change it manually here. Uh, when we go back, sorry about that, we we'll now have a logon. Much better. So we have a username, and we have a password. And just like before, I give you the source, and I'm not going to do it because it takes five minutes every time I do it. You don't have any weird ID stuff for the controls or all kinds of crazy names. So this doesn't do much, and it doesn't have a button to submit. So we'll go back and update that quite a bit here. So one interesting thing you can do is you can actually use something called uh, data annotations to change things around. And we'll get to that, but right now I'm just going to do what's called strongly typed binding. So we have a logon model available here. And if you look at our logon controller, uh, right now it doesn't actually return it, so it's void. So what we're going to do is we're going to go var model is new logon model, and we're going to go return view, and we're going to pass it the model. And now every time you do a get, you get a view with a model. Now we're going to go back to our logon page. And instead of having input type, we're going to use something called HTML helpers. So I'm going to actually step back to the presentation for a second and introduce those, and then we'll come back. Um, this will actually come in really handy. I'm going to skip master pages because we went over it. But So action filter attributes uh, are a custom attribute which performs logic before or after an action method executes. And remember, action methods are the methods on controllers. Uh, you implement the action filter attribute abstract class. It can mark a specific action method or the entire controller, which means it marks all methods. And for example, you could use this to create a customer required attribute that redirects the user if they are not logged in. So it checks the session for data in the back end kind of thing. And there are some useful built-in ones that you'll want to use as well. Uh, output cache attribute is a really good one. It allows you to cache uh, the results of, a, of an action method. So say your action method hits the database every time, but it generally returns the same thing. You might want to slap this attribute on it, and it'll start caching it for you automatically. Uh, you can get more information at this link. I'm going to go a few more slides ahead before I come back, because all the things I want to do next are sort of interwoven. Uh, master pages, nearly identical in ASP.NET and master pages. The slight differences are that the MVC master page inherits from view master page instead of master page, which is why I reminded you to use the specific MVC master page. Uh, it exposes MVC specific functionalities such as HTML helpers, and there are no server side forms, as we talked about. MVC master pages are not strongly typed, so you can work around this with the view data and view bag, but effectively you can't do what we do with the view and have a master page to a model. Uh, we'll discuss this further on. Uh, and there are other creative ways to, to populate dynamic data and master pages as well. Uh, so the view data view bag is the strongly typed views. The view data and view bag can be used to pass data from a controller to a view. And you're going to say, well, the model does that. And you're right. But you can also use this, which is a view data dictionary object. 
Um, the view data is a view data dictionary object, as we just said, which uses case insensitive string keys. This is valuable to you. You don't want to worry about case. It's populated in the controller's action method and is accessed in the view. It's similar to the dictionary that you're very familiar with in .NET, but it has other functionality specific to MVC. Um, it's late bound, which sucks, so you must cast objects on dereference in view to access functionality, because all of the getters on it return object. Um, the downside is it uses magic strings to, you know, to access data, and that's not a great way to do things. Uh, but it is best used when you have a master page that needs access to a particular piece of dynamic data, but you don't want to add that data to each and every model that you create. So say on your master page you want to show the logged in user's name in the corner, hi, Dave, for example. Well, you don't want to, on every single model, build the public string username and then, you know, have a, you know, a content area on your master page where you say, hi, content area, name, username, and then spit that out from your model because that's just tedious and painful. Instead, you can use the view data in ViewBig, which you can access from the, from the master page. Uh, and that's where it's somewhat useful. Uh, the ViewBig is a new MVC concept, and effectively it's just a dynamic wrapper around the view data, which means they're interchangeable. So you can assign a value to ViewBig, and then you can uh, view big on name in the controller, which is a dynamic type here, so there's no compile time validation. But you can retrieve it with view data name in the view. And you can do the opposite. You could assign it with this in the view and retrieve it with this in the controller. It doesn't matter. But that's MVC3, and this demo is in MVC2, so I'm not going to be able to show you the difference. I'm just going to be able to show you this version of it. Um, the view big is slightly more convenient than view data because you don't need to cast the result on dereference because it's dynamic. But it is dynamic, so be careful about it. Uh, there's no compile time validation, and if you point to nothing, you're going to get some runtime exceptions. Uh, the best solution is to use view data and view big in concert with strongly typed views. So your pages use your page specific data that you put in the model, but you, you share data, such as the username that you popped in the top right corner of your master page, in the view data or view big uh, for access and master pages, which, you know, master page is basically a shared view. Um, and you should take note in design practice, if you're calling your partial view on almost every single view page, it should be a master page. Um, HTML helpers are available in the view page, view user control, and view master page files. And they're called per traditional web form syntax. So you can go enter your name, and then you can go html.text box name, which creates a text box with the name of name. Uh, they render HTML to the view in all cases. That is to say, sometimes they might render blank, but the purpose of them is to render HTML. It's not to do anything else. Uh, most of the time, you can customize them to do other things, but you probably shouldn't. Commonly used HTML helper methods include render partial and render action, which this renders a partial view page. And this renders a partial view page by passing first to the controller's action, which can do business logic on the view page. Um, whereas this just calls the view page directly. And then you can also um, use the strongly typed input binding commands, such as text box 4, password box 4, etc. And I'm about to do that. Uh, you can create powerful extension methods to do many useful things for you. The return type for your custom method should be MVC HTML string, which you don't care about right now, but you can reference this when you're building your own stuff. Uh, and the tip is to add your extension class namespace to your application via web config, and then all of you pages see it automatically, instead of having to include it on a page-by-page -page basis. Um, I'm going to go to partial views. A partial views are a way to call or embed one view within another view, so they're basically user controls. They're good to use for common display elements, which we'll use on some pages, but not all pages. So you might display a logon uh, prompt on a couple pages, and that would be a good partial view, and that's what we're going to do in a minute. Um, you might do an e-commerce user's order summary or something else. Uh, they could be evoked using HTML at render partial, where you indicate the name of the partial view as part of the parameters. Um, you can also pass part of your model to the view, and that's where things get awesome. Uh, and if you must do complex business logic prior to rendering your view, you can evoke an action method on the controller via render action, which returns the same partial view result. Uh, and again, you can pass your model to that action method. Uh, so now we're going to get to the very entertaining stuff here. So binding form inputs to models. So MVC will automatically bind your form data by convention of name, and it's strongly typed which is completely awesome. You don't have to go into like your request form or query string and try and figure out what it is and cast it and hope it works and try catch it and mess around. You can do optional parameters on your methods with nullable types. So that's the in question mark, um, string can be null, bool question mark, etc. cetera. Uh, it can be held in many ways. You can create, so this is with referring to your action method. You can create individual parameters on your action method for each form input name. And so what that means is you could, um, in our 
application where I did this uh, right here, you don't have to do that. You could go string username, string password, and then you could type everything properly and keep them all in the same case. Um, this is the same thing, really, except obviously I don't have a model anymore to work with. You could create the model here, new model, model username is username, password is password, and return it. But this has disadvantages. And also, if you're, say, submitting somebody's customer's address, this might be 30 or 40 parameters long. It gets really ugly. So you should stick with the, uh, the model approach like this, which is the same thing because the model has username and password properties. Uh, going back to the presentation for a sec, and then I'm going to show you a ton of cool code. So one way is to create individual parameters like I just did. It's not, it's unwieldy because like I said, it's, you'll have tons and tons of parameters. You can create a model that contains the properties of the same name as your inputs, which is what we just did. And that enables something called data annotations more easily. Um, and we're about to get into that. And it allows you to reuse your model as well by passing it to the view from the action method. And that means what I, what I just did. I had the input parameter of the model and then I just returned it right away because it will be instantiated. Uh, the combination of of both of the above is sometimes the best, but that's up to your discretion in particular implementation. And remember, don't do the form string lookups in MVC. You can do them, don't do them. If you're doing them, you're doing it wrong. I'm gonna circle this three or four times. You're doing it wrong, don't do it. So, uh, last thing I'm gonna talk about on the slide side, and I'm gonna do a whole whack of code, is data annotations and automatic server-side validation. So like routing, data annotations is a technology that exists outside of MVC, but is used and included within the framework. It's a set of attributes that can be slapped on the properties of the model to automatically validate input. Um, I'm going to skip all this, and I'm just going to do it. But long story short, you can specify the error messages, you can specify the names, you can specify whether it's required, you can match it against regular expressions, you can set a length on it, a range of values on it, it's terrific stuff, and you can build your own too. Um, within a controller's action method, you can check this generic property not literally a generic like a .NET, but this always there property, persistent property, model state dot is valid to see if your, your input is valid. Um, and you can add, if so, you may return the view and the errors will be automatically displayed. And I know this sounds like a lot of data, but I'm gonna like write this all out and it's gonna make total sense in a minute for you. Um, you may add error messages to the model state object yourself. You can display the error summary on the page. You can display individual errors. Uh, if you use HTML helpers to generate your form inputs, which we're about to do, the individual rendered inputs will also get markup when there's an error. They'll get the class input validation error by default, which allows you to highlight things red, for example. That gives you total control over the appearance. And you can do automatic client-side validation that conforms to your data annotation rules. Uh, this is one of the cooler parts of MVC. It'll automatically use jQuery and, and uh, JavaScript to do client-side validation for you just by this call. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. I'm not going to go into it in this presentation. It's an advanced topic. If you hit Google or Bing, you'll have it down in five minutes. Um, so now, having said all of that, we're going to do a lot of code. Let's see. So we're back here. One thing we just discussed was using a model instead of named parameters. So we're doing that. But this doesn't do us a lot of good, right? Because we're going to pass the username and password but we want to know that they're valid and somewhat useful to us. So this is where we're going to start to use data annotations. The first one is we're going to give it required. Uh, value required? Oh, right, I don't have the namespace. There we go. So now this is required. This is also required. And just for fun, let's give this one, I don't know, string length of, say, eight at most, just to, so we can show you a couple kinds of validation. And now we've slapped a couple of things onto these fields. Um, you can also slap on, I think it's called display name. I can't remember the name of the parameter. Might be display. Yeah, you can name the parameter here and have it uh, pop up in your application. And we'll do that in a minute. I'm just gonna remember what it's called. I think it's display. Let's try it. No, it's not display, but we'll come back to it. We're not going to reorder it right now. So we have required for both, and we have string like debate on the password. So we've done that. We save that. We compile it. It compiles. Um, now what we want to do is we want to go back to our model, and because we're going to be posting that data back, we're going to go into the post method, and we're going to check 
if model state dot is valid. And this is going to return true if they put in good data and bad if they put in bad data. So if it's bad, we're going to return the view that they're already on. And by convention, when you return the view here, you're returning the login view under the logon folder. Uh, we're going to return the view passing the invalid model. If they got here, we know they were successful. And we're going to, you know, this is where you would do your, um, your call out to a helper or handler class to validate the logon. So you'd be like, you know, you'd be like, uh, logon helper dot logon user uh, username, uh, sorry, model dot username. I'll tell you what, we'll just make it really easy and build a fake one real quick. I'm going to create a folder and we're going to call it helpers. We're going to create a class and we're going to call it logon helper. We're going to create a method and we're going to go public bool logon user string username string password. This is where you do your business logic. I'm just going to return true because, you know, whatever you do to log on your user might be specific to your application and I'm not too concerned with it. So every time you try to log on the user here, you're going to be successful for now. Um, we'll change that later to show you different outcomes. Or actually, we'll make it false for now. Why not? No, we'll leave it true. So we've got our validation. We've got our helper. Now that we've got our helper, we're going to need to... Uh, instantiate it. You could inject it. What we're going to do is we're just going to have it populate itself. We're going to have, uh, uh, what do I call it, logon helper. Uh, I'll give it an underscore. I think I actually need to set that. Make it pop up. And we're going to go logon helper is new logon helper. That means this is instantiated every time we hit an action method because the controller gets invoked and populates it. So now instead of faking it, what we're going to do if logon helper dot logon user of model dot username and model dot password is true. We're actually going to return a redirect to the success page. Otherwise, this means it failed. We're going to return the same view that we're on right now with the model. And we might even add to the model logon failed or something. You can do that if you want. You could go like uh, public bool logon successful or is logon successful. You don't have to use this as part of the form, but you can use this to pass data down if you want. And actually, we might even do it through view data because it's a good way to show off view data. Sorry, I'm jumping around a bit. So if we failed, we're going to go view data, logon success equals false. Uh, actually, we're going to get logon failed is true because it's always going to be false by default. So now we've got some view data that we're looking at in the case of the logon failed. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, in the get, we're not going to worry about it, but just because we need to have it in both so that we don't pull a null. We're going to go view data logon failed is false. So now on our login page, some cool things we're going to do. We're going to go if view data looks familiar, right? Logon failed. Uh, I have to cast it, unfortunately. Again, it's late bound. If full data logon failed, uh, what are we going to do with it? I'm going to display maybe, sorry, but your logon failed. And we're going to bold it. Again, you'd make this cleaner if you're building a real site, but do what I can. And then we're going to close it. So now, if we see the logon failed, we're going to return logon failed. We could have returned this on the model, but we didn't because I want to show you view data at the same time. Now, the neat part about this, uh, we don't need to do the input like that. What we can actually do is go HTML.text box 4, and we can use link, if you're familiar with it, and it's automatically using the model as the input, username. 
and then it takes a couple of other parameters, such as HTML attributes, if you want to slap them on there. But you don't have to, and we're not going to in this case. So we just spat out this exact same thing in a more intuitive, compilable, testable way. We're going to do, I think there's a password box or password for. We're going to go i, i.password. We don't need this either. If you wanted to slap custom stuff on this, you could use, and I'm just going to do it here, anonymous methods to be like, oh, I'm sorry, that needs to be within there. We could go say class equals hello. Are we actually going to, oh, and because it's class is a keyword, you got to escape it. Are we actually going to do anything with that? No, but I want to show you that it renders. So now we've got all this crazy stuff put together. I'm going to compile it. It succeeded. I'm going to go over to the page, hopefully. I'm going to reload it. And it looks like the same page. You'll notice that it didn't render that, uh, that error. That error thing, I said that your password was incorrect, and that's because logon failed is false. Uh, if we view the source, I'm going to try and share this with you very quickly. Share program. Looks like this one. You'll see there's no special markup. It has the class of hello that I gave it. It has an ID of username automatically, and the ID of username automatically is a type of text, and the value is blank. You might ask yourself why the value is blank. The reason the value is blank is because we didn't set a value to the model, but if we do now, it automatically populates to the page. What does this buy you? This allows you to set your foreign values from your controller initially if you want. This also allows you, when you reload the page on a post that failed, to persist values. If I type in this, type in this, and submit, and it's wrong, this will remain. So a good example of that, I appear to have lost my live meeting pop-up here. And David Lomnick has actually messaged me and said, do you need a submit button on your form? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'll be adding that in a sec. To come back here, uh, We'll go, you can do the HTML submit thing for it, but I'm just going to go info type equals submit uh, value equals submit. That should pretty much do it, I think. So, you notice that we have it bound to username and password here. What does this buy us? If in the initial display we wanted to put a default user in, like model.username is Joe, you're going to find that that actually persists when we reload the page, whoops, it's trying to share again. Sorry, I don't know why my live meeting is being all haywire. Let's see if this works. Someone wants to share. That one? All right. This should be Joe. There you go. So you can persist data, and it's dynamically bound. Um, I'm going to unbind that because, you know, we're not that concerned with it. And I'm going to fail the logon initially. So we're going to come back here. We're going to take this out because we don't want to hard code the initial stuff. Uh, we're going to have it, because it's going to check when we post. It's going to check if the model is valid. If not, it's going to return. And if it is invalid, we're going to want to return something to the user. So the first thing we're going to want to do is on our page, we're going to want to modify it to ask for information for the user. So what we're going to do is go HTML. Sorry, you need to have the equal sign for this. HTML.summary. Is it summary? Error summary? I have it in my slides. We can look at them real quick. Sorry, I don't remember everything all the time. Uh, look at my slides. Uh, validation summary. And we can say something went wrong or whatever. So we'll do that. And I'm going to spell it right. You can notice one of them is the message that comes up. So we're going to have a validation summary. This only renders if the model state is invalid. And another thing we want to do is let the people know that these things are required. So what we can do there is go HTML.validation4, validation message4. And again, you can go i.username. I believe the second part is the validation method required. Close that and that. Steal this and put it right here. 
And I'm going to, just so you can see that they're unique, I'm going to put password required and username required. Now I'm going to compile that. Everything compiles. Last thing we're going to do, because when we actually go to the logon controller, it's going to check for a valid or not, and then it's going to try and log on the user, and I initially want to show you a fail. So we're going to make that return false. So now that we've done all that fun stuff, coming back to the login page, we're going to reload it. Joe probably shouldn't be there anymore because we unbound that. We're going to type nothing, and we're going to submit. Uh, that was exciting. Oh, it, I posted a login instead of log on. Of course I did. Change that very quickly. Should have picked a different word other than login or log on because I use them interchangeably. Go back for round two. I'm going to go back. We're going to put in nothing and press submit. We're going to reload the page. I'm going to make sure the source says, okay, now I'm pointing at log on. We'll have a much better time now. Press submit. And notice that it says that the object reference is not set to an instance of an object on the view data, and this is why I don't like using the view data. So log on failed is not existing. So we come back here. We take a look at our controller, and we notice that in this situation, when we return this model, we haven't actually populated it. And this is why the view data is not that much fun, because you've got to do it everywhere all the time. So we're going to leave this as false, and we're going to put it back. Because what happened there was it went here, it realized that it wasn't valid, and then it came back. And I'm actually going to attach the debugger and show you that. thinking real hard about getting the debugger attached. So I'm going to pause this. And now when I go back to the page, the web page has expired. I'm just going to go back to here with a get. I'm going to reload it to make sure we got a fresh one. Now I'm going to push the button. I'm going to switch over to my debugger. Check this out. So we're in here. And notice that our login model is actually populated. But it's populated with blank or null values because we didn't enter anything. So is valid is false because of our data annotations. So we're going to set the view data to false, and we're going to return the view. Was that bias? That bias is something you're going to be pretty interested in. As soon as I find the logon page, I think it's this one. Sorry, live meeting is an interesting content sharing thing, and it's not working very well for me when I go back and forth. Um, is it this one? Yes, it is. Notice that it came back with something went wrong. The username field is required and the password field is required. That's our summary that we put in with that one line. These came up because we didn't put in valid data. Now, if we put in this value, and I'm just let me stop debugging because it's not really that essential to go back and forth 100 times a minute. If we put in this value, we'll leave password blank, same deal, but only the password is required. If we leave this blank and put this in, same deal, but only the username is required. If we put both in, but this isn't the eight characters that we specified, it's still going to tell us, well, it should have told us it was wrong. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the limit is 8. If I put in more than 8, it's going to tell us automatically that it should be a string with a maximum length of 8, all of which you can override. So once we put in everything valid, which, as you saw by accident, we did just a second ago, it's going to come back and tell us my login failed. And it's going to tell us that because I automatically had that method return a fail, if you remember. So now, in the 10 minutes I left, I'm going to whip out two more last cool features. I'm going, to la I'm going to whip out an attribute that allows us to check for a user being logged on. I'm going to create a folder, and we're going to call it attributes. And you can call folders pretty much whatever you want. We're going to add a class, and we're going to call it, and by, because this attribute has to be named the attribute convention, we're going to call it user required attribute. And we're going to make an inherit from action filter attribute. And it's going to use WebMVC, and now we have something great, and now we're going to override on action executing, which means it happens before we render the page and go through the controller method. We're going to call the base. We have filter context. You notice that filter context gives us things like view data, route data, uh, HTTP context, the request context, information about the controller, all the stuff you could ever hope for. So we're going to go, if the context session value, say, username, Let's do a string as null or empty on that. We're going to return 
Uh, no, we don't return. I'm sorry. We go filter context dot result equals new redirect result, and we give it the URL we want. We're going to put it back to login. Is it log on or log in? I don't even remember. I think it's log on. It keeps screwing that up. So what does this do when I attach the appropriate number of closing brackets? What is it complaining about? Oh, I have to cast it, of course. Another fun thing about session. Now, we've got an action method. It checks before you execute anything. It basically says, if you've got a user in session, if we don't have a user in session, so if it's null or empty, we return you redirected to log on. See, it's pretty useful to us. We're going to create a final view. Um, it's going to be called the success view, I guess, and we'll put it we'll put it in log on just for fun, just to make it quick and easy. Call it success. Uh, it doesn't have, it to have any type because we don't need anything related to it right now. Default master main content. Now we've got a success page. To have a success page that we can actually use, we have to give it something in the controller, uh, the login controller. So we're going to create. And we're going to make it get only. Good practice is to slap get on things when you intend for them only to be get, not just leave blank. We're going to go public action results uh, success is what I called it. We're not going to pass anything to it, and we're just going to return view. Now, this can be accessed at any time by anybody right now. But one thing we're going to do is we're going to go user. Was it user required? Which just needs a namespace. And now, whenever you go to this page, it's going to check if there's a user in session, and it's going to bounce you. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go and route the success page. I'm just going to copy and paste it. It's the logon controller. Uh, wait, what's the second part of this? Oh, URL. That's probably going to be success then. Controller logon action success compile. I'm going to show you that this works by going to the login page. We're going to try and reload the page. I'm not going to repost it. So I'm just going to hit enter. I'm going to reload it. We still have a logon page. We still have an index page. We also have a success page. But you'll notice that when I go to success, it points you back to logon because we're not logged in. So what we can do instead is when we go back to the application, we can change our logon controller. When it redirects to success, well, we're going to leave it redirecting to success. Um, now, be careful here, because you could create an infinite loop. Because if it was successful, but you didn't set the session variable, it would redirect to success, which would redirect to logon, which would redirect to... Actually, that would be okay, because it would go to the get method, and it would be okay. But you can create infinite loops and redirects, so be careful, which causes a stack overflow and crashes your application, obviously. In our helper method that we created, we're going to create... We're going to return true, because we're going to say they logged in successfully. More importantly, we're going to pass uh, state-based session... And we're going to go session username equals, I don't know, let's put username, why not? That's a pretty good dynamic example. Uh, we'll go back to the logon controller. We will pass it uh, session, which is available on your controller, and everything's all set up. So now when you log on, this is the last part of the demo. We have the invalid states. We have the sort of invalid states, and we have the valid states, which redirect to success, which lets you in because you're logged on. And that, my friends, is a pretty good introductory MVC application. Heading back to the presentation, the last thing I'll talk about is customizations. Customizing the MVC framework, uh, it has been designed to be very loosely coupled and incredibly customizable and modifiable. Uh, most of MVC's important methods and functions are marked virtual so that you can implement your own variations as you desire. You can install your own view engine, you can install your own routing engine, you can install your own controller engine, you can install your own controller factory engine, you can do whatever you want with this thing, which makes it very powerful. Uh, you can swap in, and then I obviously just said all these things, to obtain desired functionality. And that is my demonstration. To get started with yourself, go to ASP.NET get a copy of the source code, super, super useful to you. Uh, it's at codeplex.com, this is the official Microsoft Codeplex page. This is the source code for the actual compiled MVC framework. You can use it as a reference when you don't know what things are doing, or if you want to even customize it and recompile it, you could do that. Um, and again, feel free to contact me at this, you know, become my LinkedIn, I don't know what you call it, associate, friend, pal, whatever, if you like. Uh, feel free to send me an email. At this time, if anybody has questions, I've got five minutes. Knock yourself out.
And everybody's typing questions, I'm assuming, so I'm going to wait a couple seconds to see if anything comes in. Nothing so far. Um, again, definitely download the source code. There are a lot of resources available on MSTN as well. Um, ASP.NET slash MVC has a ton of tutorials that are very useful, incredibly interactive. The first one of which will uh, will make you effectively build a music store online, which is pretty cool. Uh, Michael's question is, I have two questions. Feel free. Oh, and again, I apologize for all the mistakes I made there, particularly around routing. I just haven't done routing like that in a while, and I really should have. Uh, while I'm waiting for Michael's uh, two questions, I'm going to answer Ron's question. Ron asks me, how do you handle something like a data grid? And the answer, Ron, is you don't. Uh, data grids are an ASP.NET control that rely on, on postbacks and state. You actually don't have data grids. Uh, one thing you can do, though, is in the actual ASPX file, and I'm just going to switch the content over to uh, the code for the question and answer period. In the actual, um, uh, you know, in the pages, you can do for loops and you can do iterators. So what you could do is you could create your, you know, your data grid of data as an enumerable of whatever type you have or complex type. You could attach it to your model and you could come in here and go for each whatever on model dot my stuff and you could spit out a repeating output on your page. And that would be one good way to handle that. Um, does that answer your question? I'm assuming it does. He raised his hand. I'm going to guess that's a yes. I don't know. Uh, Eric, you're welcome by all means. Uh, feel free to download the source code, which I'm going to get uh, Brian to help me throw up on this uh, on this presentation here in a sec. Um, I believe Michael did have two questions, but I haven't seen them. Um, I've got two more minutes, and I'm going to hand it back to Brian here. Oh, yes, he said it did answer his question. Uh, I'm glad to hear it, Ron. But, yeah, you got to get out of the mindset of, of the controls and the data grids and the views and binding because all that stuff relies on having a code behind. Um, Michael asks, well, I mean, you don't, don't get me wrong, right? You don't have to get out of that mindset, but if you want to use MVC, you have to get out of that mindset. Uh, Michael says, I'm the only programmer on a large website. Is MVC for me? Uh, the answer to that depends on what kind of programmer you are, my friend. I, myself, am a fairly uh, uh, interested programmer, and I like to build my own home projects. I'm building something right now, and I'm building it in MVC by myself. Um, if you're going to do it for commercial purposes, I don't know the answer. It depends on you and your aptitude and how much you like to tinker and how much control you want or need over your site. If you want to do it as a learning experience, absolutely. I implore and recommend all of you on this presentation to uh, go ahead and build your own application in MVC, at least initially, something simple like I did, and, and tinker around with it and add to it, you know, come up with new requirements for yourself. Maybe once you're logged in, you want to display an order list or something, all that good stuff. Uh, Greg asks me, what is your take on MVC's old-school ASP style of code in the HTML? You know, I kind of like it, and I kind of don't like it, but the nice thing is with MVC3, you get a new view engine called the Razor View Engine, which allows you to do very fluid syntax within your view pages. Uh, feel free to Google Razor, or, you know, go to MSTN and look up Razor, R-A-Z-O-R, or Z-O-R if you're American or whatnot. Um, I don't mind the, the old school syntax. It can get a bit clunky. It can get a bit uh, convoluted. But one thing to keep in mind is if it gets clunky and convoluted, you're probably doing too much business logic on your view. And what you should do is do that stuff in the controller and just pass plain old data at, into the model to the view that just spits it out and doesn't think about it. Michael asks, each user in my application gets a custom list of pages that they are allowed to view. The list is data-driven. How can I accomplish this with MVC? It depends on the specifics and the implementation of it, but obviously they get a couple sets of pages. The list is data-driven. I'm guessing database-driven. You would model it. You would have, you know, once your user is logged in, you would pull the list for the user, and for each thing in the list, you would spit it out on a page. Um, another thing you could do is create a custom action filter attribute that verifies that the user has access to that page before rendering it, just like we did with the, uh, with the success page. I really can't go into more detail than that because there's 100 million ways to do that, but that would be my first step, definitely. 
Um, I'm just deleting a couple questions as I go because I'm getting totally lost. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, Brian makes a very good point. Um, the things that I broke in the demo are things you might break when you build your first application, so maybe it's valuable to you to see what I screwed up and how I fixed it. Um, if you don't appear to be any other questions aside of that, if there are, feel free to link to me, send me a message, uh, send me an email. I'll definitely get back to you. It may not be right away. Um, I'm a busy guy, and i got drinking plans tonight, but definitely in the future I'll get back to you. Uh, so without further ado, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I'm going to hand it back to Brian by muting my microphone just as soon as I figure out how to do that. Excellent. David, that was a fantastic introduction to MBC. And uh, from the comments I've gotten in here is that it was really well received. Um, Definitely thank you very much for standing up and putting on a, a fairly um, broad, I should say, presentation. Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it greatly. And I do hope to get you uh, up on the podium here again in the near future. It was absolutely my pleasure. Uh, definitely, I'd be happy to speak on any